morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the 17th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee. Uh, can I, as usual, please ask everybody to make sure their mobile phones are switched off or not going to make any kind of noise? Uh, now, we've received apologies today from the convener, and Annabel Ewing is participating as committee substitute for him. Uh, I do welcome Annabel to the meeting, as I think this is your first attendance at the Finance Committee, so you're very welcome and the uh, first time you've been a substitute. So I'd invite you to declare any relevant interests that you may have. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I would simply point to my uh, entry in the Register of Interest, and for the sake of completeness, would say that I am a, a, a member of the Law Society of Scotland, and I do hold a current practising certificate. Thank you very much for that. Um, we move on to agenda item one, which is a decision on taking business in private. A, our first item this morning is to decide whether to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed on that? Agreed. Yes, members have indicated their agreement, uh, so that is okay. We move on to agenda item two, Scotland's public finances post-2014. Um, and our second item, therefore, is to take evidence on Scotland's public finances post-2014 from John Dickey of the Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland and Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland. Now, I think members have received copies of written submissions from both of our witnesses, so we will go straight to questions from the committee. Now, we're fairly pressed for time this morning, uh, and I would ask that each member restricts his or her questions to no more than 10 minutes, uh, and I will set the example at the beginning. Uh, I'll need to be quite strict on this, because the session finishes it. We have to finish this at 10.45, because John Dickey is going to another committee this morning, uh, immediately thereafter. Uh, so to give everyone a, a fair amount of time, if we start with a 10-minute limit, if there's more time at the end, I can give people a second uh, shot. <clears throat> so uh, the process will be to invite questions uh, from members for about 75 minutes, and uh, we shall begin. So if I can ask a couple of uh, questions, I think, to, to start with. Um, Mr Dickey, you referred in, in your paper to the 2010 Child Poverty Act uh, which, as I understand it, was intended to eradicate child poverty, and you actually used that word, eradicate, uh, by 2020. Um, I mean, firstly, am I right in thinking that eradicate means still 10% of children were going to be left in poverty? <laughs> and, but more substantially, is this achievable? It, it, it is. It's still it's, it's to reduce child poverty to 10% um, of children living in um, relative low income by, by 2020. So that's, that's, the, that's the headline target. Um, there are other targets with, that uh, are to be met as part of the Act as well, um, relating to a um, combination of relative low income and material deprivation, um, relating to persistent poverty and relating to um, absolute uh, low income. Um, but that, you're, you're right about that, head, that headline target uh, to reduce to 10% to of children. Is that possible? It, it should be possible. Um, we have unusually high levels of poverty here in Scotland and across the UK. Other countries um, have levels of child poverty that we would count as eradication. So, um, for example, uh, Norway, Denmark have come close to, if not below, 10% of children uh, living uh, in poverty. So it should be possible. I think the other key thing to say is that real progress was made towards meeting those targets since the targets were, 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 were set, well, since the, the, the initial commitment to eradicate child poverty was made uh, at UK level um, back in um, 1997. Um, so, so real progress was made in Scotland alone, 160,000 children uh, lifted out of poverty up until 2011-12. Um, that 44% reduction in, in child poverty. Um, although it has to be said, even if those gains, those, that progress had been um, consistently followed up, it would have actually been 2017 before child poverty was eradicated, but clearly progress was in the right direction and, and policy worked. Um, uh, investment in child benefit, tax credits uh, at UK level, uh, introduction of national minimum wage, um, support to parents to move into work, introduction of um, improved childcare support, both at UK and Scotland level, all worked to, 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 to reduce levels of child poverty. And perhaps more importantly, worked to improve um, measurable um, child wellbeing. So Scotland and the UK's position on child poverty and on child wellbeing um, improved relative to other countries in quite an unprecedented way. 
Um, but, of course, we now know that the uh, direction of travel looking ahead is, 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 is far worse. And the reality is that the current approach um, that's been taken at UK level to tax and benefit policy is likely to see um, up to 100,000 children pushed into poverty. So an additional 100,000 children living in poverty by 2020, rather than uh, the, the, the reduction in child poverty that would be needed in order to meet those 2020 targets. So the challenge, I suppose, um, for, for government at UK and at Scotland level, but at UK level, given the big tax and benefit levers that lie there, and given that it's those levers and the policies around tax and benefits that uh, lie behind that huge increase in child poverty that, that's forecast, and that's not forecast by us, that's forecast by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, who have modelled the impact of tax and benefit policy on levels of child poverty uh, in Scotland and across the UK. Um, so, you know, the position that it's just inevitable that by 2020, whether you know, Scotland's running the show or UK's running the show, we're just not going to meet this target because there's just not enough money to, to fix it. I think we need, a, we need, we need to, to, to think, I mean, we need a fundamental change of approach. Um, at, so wherever powers end up lying post-2014, um, we'd need to see a significant shift in the way that we use our tax and benefit policy. So that's about... Uh, investing again in child benefit and tax credits and in the financial support that families need um, and using our, you know, and ensuring that those resources are put in place. I think it's very difficult now, I think, across the board, people realise it would be very difficult, given where we are now and how, how, you know, how few years there are to 2020, to bring about that sea change. But we can certainly change the direction of travel uh, very markedly. And, and if I we could just do one thing, what would, what would be top of your list to do? One single, yeah, it's always, always a hard one. I think we do need to, I mean, again, this is more directed at, at UK level currently, where powers lie at UK level, is we need to um, reinstate that link between um, operating of benefits and tax credits and, and inflation. That, that link's been broken, which means that uh, those families, both in and out of work, who who rely on tax credits and, and benefits as for a substantial part of their income are seeing their incomes fall further and further behind uh, relative to, to the actual cost, uh, actual inflation, and, and, and now and, and earnings as earnings start to, to increase again, hopefully. Okay. I mean, Mr Scott, you, I know you're in a slightly different area, and I've got <laughs> yeah. a specific question for you as well, but I mean, if you want to comment on anything that's been said so far, please well, feel free. Families with disabled children are even more likely to be living in poverty than uh, those of the general population. And on top of that, the UK government and Scottish government are committed to implementing the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, which actually states that disabled people need an adequate income to live on uh, to be able to participate fully in society. And again, exactly the same situation is arising where more disabled people are expected to be living in poverty over the next four or five years because of the range of benefit cuts, where over half the cuts are, are going to fall on disabled people and their families. So it's, it's exactly the same scenario, even for adult uh, disabled people um, that's being faced, that, that the direction of travel at the moment is going to put more of them in, into poverty, and that that could be reversed, both at a UK and at a Scottish level, with different approach to how tax and benefits are uh, how tax is collected and how uh, you, you view benefit spending. Instead of seeing benefit spending, as we say, as a safety net, I think it should be seen much, much more as something to support people to participate in society. And uh, if you view it that way, um, you make savings in other areas and you increase revenue. I mean, it's like the, the Scottish Government's childcare strategy. If you get more women into work, then you bring back in the additional revenue that pays for that. If you get more disabled people participating in society, you reduce health and care costs and you increase revenue as they participate in the workplace rather than as at the moment where more than half of disabled people who work in age don't work. Is there a timing issue there, though? I mean, you said just now we need to view benefits differently. Well, that's just no. kind of like our attitude, and, and you use the word like investment, and we should treat it as an investment in the, in the paper, which is, is fair enough. But, I mean, you also say such investment would cost money in the short term, but would lead to savings in the longer term. Yeah. I mean, have you any suggestions how we find that money for the short term? Um, seemingly, HMRC um, down south has found £28 billion 
more in the last year through chasing tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, that shows what can be done if you apply yourselves to the problem uh, of increasing your revenue sources so that you can make that investment um, in your people to get them out of poverty by a whole range of means. And, you know, it's always difficult when you're put in the spot to say one, there's one way to, of doing it. Because I, I don't think there is one way of doing it. I think that you do have to have a range of measures to assist people out of poverty. But one of them is uh, to view them you know, as, as citizens who you want to participate in society. And once they begin doing that, people get jobs not because uh, they go to the job centre. The vast majority of people who go into work get jobs because of word of mouth. And if they don't participate in society and don't meet other people in employment, they don't hear that word of mouth. That's, you know, so the first thing is get them out and get them active um, in, in various activities, volunteering. Uh, being, being one of the prime ways in moving from a situation where you're doing nothing to one where you're participating, you're meeting people in employment and you begin to hear of those opportunities. Okay. Did you want to come back in, Mr Dickie? Yeah. yeah, no, I suppose just on this issue of whether we have the resources to um, invest in the social security and the, the financial support that, that, that families need. I think in my paper I pointed to the UK Treasury's own analysis of the cumulative impact of budgets since 2011. And what it demonstrates is that the, the combined effect of tax and benefit policy has been to increase the um, incomes of most of those in the top half of the population, and the wealthiest half of the population, and to reduce the incomes of most of those in the bottom half of the population. So clearly there's been, there's been resources there in the approach to the public finances that have allowed us to increase the, the incomes of those in the wealthiest half of the population, but continue to uh, cut the incomes of those in the bottom half. And it's, the, it's those cuts that lie behind the forecast increases of child poverty. So there are other, these, are, these are political choices rather than inevitable consequences of, um, uh, of, of needing to cut the deficit or, or, or approach to, to, to balancing the, the, the public finances. OK, thanks very much. Uh, well, I said I was going to be disciplined, so I've used up my uh, ten minutes. Um, so the next question, if people can indicate, by the way, if, if they want to ask questions, but uh, Jamie Hepburn is going to be next. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. And, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, John Dickey's already uh, referred to the uh, IFS uh, forecast of an increase of 100,000 more children in Scotland living in poverty as a result of uh, UK government tax and benefits uh, policy. But I want to tie that to, to something else in uh, your paper, uh, John, because you uh, refer to analysis for CPAG suggesting the costs of child poverty in Scotland alone amount to around £3.5 billion, pounds, uh, presumably with this upward trend in, in more children coming into poverty, uh, this, this figure could grow. But I just wonder if you could, could quantify that a little, what, what you mean by uh, this uh, figure, what, what, what do you mean by these costs? These costs, well, I mean, it's, it's, what, what was done, this is work that's been done by um, Donald Hirsch at uh, Loughborough University um, at UK level, commissioned um, by, by JRF. Um, so it looks at, you know, what are the additional costs that child poverty generates, uh, you know, the levels of child poverty we have generates on, on, on the public purse, um, looking first at the additional you know, the additional cost of services. And what they did was kind of look at, you know, cost of services, so social services, health, housing, education. What are the additional costs that uh, incur in... And they looked at areas of where there was high levels of child poverty and what the additional costs there are and, and quantified that. Um, so it's the additional costs in terms of service provision, picking up, basically picking up the pieces of, of child poverty, picking up the pieces, trying to fix the damage that growing up in poverty costs in terms of uh, children's health, their well-being, their education, but also looked at what's the lost income uh, in, in terms of um, tax receipts um, that are the consequence of the reduced chances of, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the likely to be earning less as an adult um, if you've grown up in poverty, and also the increased spending on benefits um, that uh, are the consequence of um, that, that you're, you're being less likely, or be more likely to, to, to rely on benefits, the source of income uh, as an adult. So combining those costs, cost of services and lost lost income, we, we come to that to that cost. I mean, it's interesting that the the, the academics behind the the, the work um, describe it as a cautious estimate of what the, the costs are, and of course these are the quantifiable financial costs, not taking into account the 
the, the personal costs, the actual um, the, the costs to, to, to children's experiences and families' experiences that, that come about as, of growing mm. up in poverty. Where you refer to, to lost income, lost income for the st state through taxation. Yes, yeah, so this the, is money the, 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 other flip, the flip side of that, of course, is it's a, a lost opportunity for uh, the, the people themselves because they're not in employment and the rest of it. So of as a result of these current uh, policies being pursued by the UK, that's going to be even more the case for more people in, in Scottish yes. society, presumably. So, uh, absolutely. And then um, the, 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 the figure for across the UK was in 2013, the, the estimated cost of child poverty, £29 billion, pounds, um, looking at the increased levels of child poverty forecast by the IFS and taking those into account, then the, the figure for 2020 would be £35 billion pounds a year. Uh, the costs of, 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 of picking up the pieces of child poverty. And that was done at a UK level. In terms of the Scotland figure, that was broken down um, looking at levels of child poverty in local authority areas across the UK and then um, pulling those together for Scotland to come up with that, that, to come up with that figure. So we actually have a figure for what, what the estimated cost for 2020 would be if we see the forecast increases. But, okay. uh, you're both, both of your papers are, are quite critical of uh, the UK uh, government's handling of uh, tax collection. Uh, you're both uh, critical of uh, the amount that's lost to uh, avoidance, uh, fraud and, and late payment. Um, I suppose the question uh, there for both of you uh, is, you know, what le lessons can Scotland draw from this, particularly if uh, we're in the, the post-2014 context where we have uh, uh, more substantial taxation powers? Well, I mean, one thing is uh, invest more in ta tax collection. Um, there are, I think, 400 officers in HMRC which are charged with pursuing uh, tax evasion and avoidance. Um, there are 4,000 officers in DWP who are dedicated to fraud, um, finding fraud in the system. And the fraud in the system in the DWP is minute compared to tax avoidance. We're talking about maybe £1.5 billion pounds a year as compared to estimates anywhere up to £80 billion pounds a year lost in tax avoidance and tax evasion. So the investment in catching those who are avoiding and evading paying tax is just not the same as the investment we put into uh, chasing uh, people uh, on low incomes on benefits. You have a, in, in so just the key thing is that whichever level tax powers lie, it's important that people have confidence that people are making the contributions that they're meant to be making um, and that those who, you know, those who have the wealth and the resources um, that could be making a contribution um, and that are needed, so desperately needed to invest in the infrastructure that we know is required for a society free of, 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 of child poverty um, in terms of our particular focus, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital that, that people have that confidence and we have robust systems in place to ensure that uh, that, 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 that tax is collected and that people see it as a, a, a positive thing to be contributing to the resources to your society that are needed to, um, you know, to, to, to maintain a level, of, a level of society that doesn't have the levels of, of poverty and inequality that we have at the moment. I mean, Bill, Bill refers to investing in collection, which is obviously a, a very important point, but surely also it's about the, the culture of uh, the tax collection agency and indeed the, the government behind it. And we know that the Scottish government's already put in place Revenue Scotland and it's got the general anti-avoidance rule for the very limited uh, tax powers that are, are coming our way under the Scotland Act 2012. But this this idea of a general anti-avoidance rule that doesn't have lots of yeah. rules which create loopholes and rest of it, is this something that you would welcome and think should be applied on a wider basis? Well, I, I just look at the amount of investment in adverts on the television, radio, on the street, you know, in billboards, etc., in the newspapers about benefit fraud. And, you know, benefit fraud shouldn't happen. You know, I'm, nobody's saying it should happen. But there are millions and millions of pounds invested in telling the public, you know, if you think your neighbour is doing this, tell us about it and we will chase them. And I don't see that level of investment in, in saying, you know, why aren't people paying their fair contribution? Only what they're expected to pay. At the end of the month, when my wages are taxed, it all, you know, t tax national insurance goes straight to the exchequer. Um, and yet there are people who can avoid paying their fair share um, through going to a, you know, 
a tax lawyer or a tax accountant. And uh, I just think they should be paying their fair share because this, the casualties are the children who grow up in poverty, whose life chances are absolutely blighted and whose life expectancy is shortened by 20 years. That's, that's the consequence. And, and I think people should be woken up to that. You know, that, that tax avoidance and tax evasions are not victimless crimes. They, are, they, are, they do have an impact on other people living in society. I've got about two minutes left in here, so I'll yes. ask another uh, question. <laughs> um, I thought you raised an interesting uh, issue in your paper, uh, Bill, about the access to work issue. And uh, you said that uh, essentially Scotland was underrepresented in terms of the numbers of disabled people who should have benefited uh, by that uh, programme. You said there should have been about 3,450 went through the programme, but there was uh, nearly, nearly 1,000. Less. Can you just talk us through that? This isn't an issue that I was particularly aware of. Well, it's, it's essentially, your access to work is supposed to be there to help people entering employment and maintaining their employment who are disabled person. Um, so um, it's there from the DWP. Um, there's so much spent throughout the UK. Um, the highest level of spend is in uh, London and the South East. And uh, the lowest level we spend is in Scotland. Um, and I don't understand why that should be the case, because we have more disabled people per head of population than most other areas of the UK. So you would expect, in fact, that it would be higher spend here rather than lower uh, per head of population, but it's the other way around. And I, I can't genuinely explain it. You know, it, again, it may be down to attitudes of officials or you know, particular rules and procedures in place, etc., that are being interpreted differently in one region to another. Um, but certainly, if you, if you look at um, spend per head of population, it's, it's much higher in London, the South East, than it is in Scotland. Um, and, and, and that has a consequence as well, because I go on later to say, you know, research done um, estimates that for every pound spent on access to work, the Treasury gets back £1.48 in revenue. So this is an investment we know absolutely results in higher tax and national insurance returns. And so for every pound you put in, you get £1.48 back. And you can ask any investment analyst, and they'll tell you that's a very, very good rate of return. And yet we're not spending it. When um, Liz Sace did the um, review of... Um, Remploy services and recommended that Remploy factories should be closed. It was on the understanding and on the consequent recommendation that the money which was saved by closing the Remploy plants should be reinvested in access to work. There has been a slight improve, improvement in the amount of money going into access to work, but nothing like the saving that the UK government has made through closing the Remploy factories. And if, if that investment was made, there would be far more disabled people who could get into work and maintain their employment than there are currently. I mean, one of the most... The, the, well, the single greatest cause of uh, disablement in uh, over 50s are strokes. And it's, it can be quite difficult to return to work afterwards because you may need adjustments both for speech and, um, you know, as a consequence of paralysis, uh, it may not be as accessible a workplace as it was before for you. That could be overcome by access to work investment, and we could return people to useful work and get revenue returns, and we're not doing it. You know? And I, th I think we need to do more to support people, both to maintain their employment and to get into work. And as I say, it's a tiny, tiny proportion, 0.4% of um, Scottish working age disabled people who get access to work support. Increase that to 3 or 4% and you know, the revenue returns will, again will pay for itself. More than pay for itself. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for your questions. Uh, Michael McMahon has got some. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, can I just start by trying to get a baseline um, in terms of what we discuss here when it comes to talking about poverty levels? I was reading an article recently where there was a, a warning given that when you're comparing country A to country B, you have to be mindful that country B may not count poverty in, in the, the way 
that country A does. Um, and, uh, is that something that, that you're aware of? Is there a, a baseline by which we can make accurate comparisons between the level of poverty uh, from one country to another? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the kind of um, internationally kind of accepted comparison is using um, those numbers of people living in households below 60% of median income before housing costs. I mean, we actually prefer the after housing cost measure because that kind of gives you a better picture of what families are actually left with once their housing costs have been paid, which doesn't, quite often doesn't reflect the actual standard of living that they're, that they're enjoying. Um, but uh, across Europe and internationally, um, the, the before housing cost, 60% um, median income, has been accepted as a as a as as, as, as the, the kind of useful tool for measuring progress uh, and levels of, of 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 poverty across Europe. So when I make those comparisons between Scotland, the UK, and other European countries, that is based on robust comparable um, uh, measures. No, that, that's helpful to know because I was concerned when I read that article that I might not actually uh, be getting a, a fair reflection. The other thing that you've also got to bear in mind is the tax level and the tax systems uh, in, in those countries and, and comparing them. And in your paper, uh, John, you, you mentioned in paragraph 2.7 the potential for using existing devolved uh, tax uh, in order to address some of the problems that we know are already here in Scotland. And there are two examples that you cite. One is Professor Bell's analysis of the impact of uh, the council tax freeze. And also, um, you know, the, the, the variable rate that we currently have has never been used. You know, are you advocating, we, as organisations, would you advocate more progressive taxation in order to address the problems that you face day in and day out from uh, your client groups? Absolutely. I think there has been, we'd like to see more discussion, more debate, more analysis of what the impact, and I'm not claiming that we've, we've not done this work, and I think it has to be thought through and done pretty thoroughly to actually look at what would be the implications of different approaches to, to local taxation, to using the, vet, the, the limited um, powers they have to vary income tax uh, in Scotland. But what would be the implications of those, both in terms of um, tackling inequality, uh, but also in terms of generating the, resource, the level of resources needed to um, provide the kind of infrastructure that I think there's a consensus that we know is needed in terms of early years, in terms of childcare provision, um, and in terms of the services that families and, and, and others at risk of poverty um, um, face. So, absolutely, that we, you know, more progressive approaches, thinking through th those are examples. We've not sort of said this is the policy to advocate, but I think there should be more discussion about um, the role that tax policy, even within the current powers and devolved powers, could play in both generating income and making an impact on um, household incomes here, here, in, here in Scotland. Um, I think when we talk about very often the kind of budget and the, the Scottish budget and the Scottish budget analysis, most of the focus is on spending and spending decisions. And I suppose it's just to draw attention to the fact there's actually, even within the existing powers, potential for more discussion about what's the actual um, role for changing the way in which we collect um, and, and, and generate resources in a way that might be more progressive uh, and also generate uh, the resources that are needed to protect families from poverty in Scotland. How would you? Yeah, uh, we, we haven't consulted on use of the um, extra three pence, up to three pence on basic rate. Um, we have consulted on um, a council tax in the past and basically our membership um, want to see the council tax either reformed or, or got rid of for a more progressive form of local taxation. I don't think anybody can maintain that you, can, you, you, you could keep the council tax freeze in place indefinitely. It's not, it's not sustainable. Um, but on the other hand, I have to look down south and according again to figures, you know, council tax is now um, the single greatest cause of debt um, advice need, needs in CABs uh, in England and, and Wales. And that reflects 600,000 people seemingly being taken to the bailiffs for council tax arrears in England and Wales. And that's not happening in Scotland. Um, so, you know, at present, uh, the council tax freeze does seem to be benefiting low income families um, in Scotland. And, and its removal would increase work disincentives um, and 
uh, you also have to find, you know, if you're going to increase it, it's, it's going to hit those and low incomes hardest because of the ratchet effect where, you know, the wealthiest members only ever pay three times more. So I, I think if you are going to get rid of the freeze, you, you need to look at local taxation much more in the round about how can we find a more progressive form of um, local taxation, which is also democratic, that people support when they go to the ballot box and, uh, and elect local councils. And I think if you, if you do start making it relevant to local people about, about things like that, um, maybe more of them will turn out and vote. <laughs> Yes, so essentially, I think the message I'm getting from both of you is you would quite like to see political parties putting forward um, at least the suggestion that we should have a, an open and honest debate about how much we should tax and what services we should spend money on and where our priorities should lie. Absolutely, so, that needs yeah. to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the ways that we can help with that type of thing is a suggestion from uh, your paper, Bill, um, 4.6, uh, Inclusion Scotland believes that a future Scotland should establish an independent review of the funding of social care to ensure that it is both equitable and in line with wider health and government aims. Um, we could do that just now, but who would do it? Who would, who would, do, who would do the who, independent who would do review? That <laughs> well, I, I would imagine it should involve service users as well as um, the usual great and the good. Um, I think it has to involve service users um, because the amount of income that's being generated um, by social care um, charging is, is a very small percentage of the amount spent on social care. It's only about 3% or so, I think, even at present, even with the rises. And a lot of that money is lost through the administration of the charging system. Um, estimates as high as, you know, three up to four pence in every, uh, every ten pence collected is, is lost in the administration costs, the assessing people, uh, etc. And you, you, could, you could make savings there. And you know, some authorities have moved to get rid of social care charging, like Fife, um, and without any huge impact on the amount of social care they provide. So I think, again, it's something that we should be looking at but disabled people have to be in there, I think, and involved, because they are at the, at the sharp end. And, and although it doesn't generate a lot of money, for those that are affected by those charges, it can be, you know, literally 70, 80, 90 per cent of disposable income that's spent on charges. Um, and uh, it leaves them on income support rates, even when they're in, in, in employment uh, in some areas. Um, so, again, what incentive is there to go into work if you know that it's simply going to be whacked back from you in a tax in all but name uh, on uh, the support that you need to lead, lead your daily life to, to get up, to dress, to eat, uh, etc. That's, that's what people are being charged for. And we don't charge people who need those services because they're ill. You know, for a short period in hospital, it's that. so I, I can't see why we're charging them to live in the community. That's helpful. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, and next up is Michael. Welcome, Chisholm. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about what your priorities would be for childcare. I mean, <clears throat> I think for a long time people have said childcare could contribute to uh, anti-poverty measures. Although, also we we know, and I could your comments on in-work poverty would be useful as well, because clearly that's a big issue even for. Uh, people who move into work, but I'm, I'm wondering in terms of childcare, a lot of discussion about that obviously currently, what would, from an anti-poverty point of view, what would be your priorities in terms of measures uh, for childcare that could be taken now initially, but you can also obviously look to the future as well and other possible scenarios? Well, yeah, the important thing is I think con continuing down the road of expanding access to, to universal early years provision in um, both this was the child care from an anti-poverty perspective it is important for two, two key reasons. One, um, in terms of ensuring all our children get access to the range of experiences and uh, informal kind of early years education uh, that, that, that benefit uh, and they've been shown to have a bit of benefit later on in life. So it's about ensuring all, all children have access to that. But it's also about ensuring 
that parents are able to take up uh, return to the labour market, uh, extend their hours in their labour market in, 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 in work, uh, and, and, in, and increase their earnings in the, work, the workplace, and obviously that making a, a, an immediate impact in terms of family incomes and, and, and ability to, to protect your children from poverty. So that's that's why childcare is so important for those, those two, 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 two reasons. It's obviously important about the in terms of priorities. Important to, to maintain that focus on quality. Um, and the quality of childcare, the quality of early years provision, as well as on the, the, the quantity of it and the number of hours that are available. It's also about giving parents choice as well, so that um, parents on, on the lowest incomes um, have the same kind of choices as those on the highest in terms of how to make the best balance between um, what they feel is in the best interest of their children in terms of uh, childcare been there for the children, their children themselves and also been able to, to take up employment opportunities. So that, that kind of choice and flexibility is really important uh, uh, priority. So we need to keep a, a focus on that. And also flexibility. I think too often at the moment, um, childcare availability and the, and the provision of early years, which forms part of the kind of childcare provision that, uh, that, that parents rely on, um, you know, set within certain hours and certain structures that don't reflect the reality of working patterns and, and working hours. So making sure that um, as we expand um, access to um, free early years, that it's done in a way that's flexible and enables parents to, to make it, take advantage of that in terms of potentially um, increasing hours in, in, in work. I'd, 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 I'd agree with all of that, <laughs> you know, obviously, and, and, but parents of disabled children face additional challenges and, and they need to be absolutely sure that the childcare that's provided will actually meet their children's needs. So that's something that we have to look at as well within, within that overall you know, increase in child, universal provision is are we, uh, as far as we can, including disabled children in that so that they can play alongside and, and uh, learn alongside um, their non-disabled peers because it's not putting them apart as far as we can. It's bringing them in. And, and if they can get that socialisation right and, and be seen as just another child, then you're one of the barriers that's there in society. You know, when we separate people off and um, put them into special provision is that they're seen as different and they see themselves as different. And, and, and a lot of the opportunities that we, we give to uh, non-disabled children are denied to disabled children. So I, I think it's something we really need to think about is it may increase slightly the, the cost of universal provision, but the benefits, again, in the long term could, could be quite profound, both in children's development and later, what their opportunities and how, how they take up those opportunities in life. Thanks for that. I mean, I, mean, I suppose there have been some of those developments in terms of nursery education and uh, UK-level childcare tax credits, but I just wondered... If, I suppose a lot of the focus on early years is from a child development point of view, which is very important. But I just, I just thought if, if we were looking at it exclusively from an anti-poverty measure, what would, what would be your priority, your one priority in terms of a policy on childcare that would actually uh, boost it as an anti-poverty measure? I mean, would it be the affordability of it? Would it be extended hours? Or what would be your priority? I, mean, I wouldn't want to, to lose sight of that kind of... Um the, 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 the quality side of it, um, you know, and the, the experience that it gives children, because that, that has a, an additional benefit for children in low-income families um, and children growing up in poverty in terms of long-term solutions to long-term routes out of poverty for, for children. In terms of, yeah, affordability is a key issue. I mean, too often it is still un, un, unaffordable uh, and too often um, not available, and this was going back to the, the flexibility, not available at the, 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 the times and in the places um, that people need to take uh, take advantage of uh, the, the employment opportunities that are available. Um, there has been work done in the past, you know, local authorities and, and, and other partners trying to find ways of providing childcare provision that is flexible. Um, and the reality is that that ends up, you know, there's, there's costs attached to that. And this is what takes us back to we need to be able to generate the resource and prioritise the resources that do allow parents um, who would otherwise um, be living in poverty and otherwise would be struggling to, to, to maximise their incomes in work. So that is about flexibility um, uh, ensuring that, uh, and ensuring that, and also um, identifying, overcoming some of the other barriers, so transport barriers that mean that parents, can't, particularly in rural areas, can't access the childcare provision that maybe is there. Um, and that's certainly been an issue that's come up 
um, quite quite regularly for those those families and, and particularly lone parents in rural areas where there's a transport barrier, there's a geographical barrier to accessing. So flexibility, affordability, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, those on the lowest incomes are able to access the childcare that is available. It's, a, it's just one, one further point on that. I mean, the prevalence and the increasing prevalence of zero hours contracts makes it much more difficult to predict when the childcare will be needed. And that in turn increases the costs of providing the childcare because if you don't know when it's going to be needed, you have to provide it all the time. And, and you could be providing childcare when there's no children there that need it and not have, you know, in another area, not having it um, when it is needed. So, you know, that again, there's like a, something we have to address and wider societal um, developments are zero hours contracts and, and um, whether that is the, the, the way forward, whether, um, you know, what cost does that impose on society over and above the cost that it imposes on the workers. Well, I agree with that entirely, which I suppose leads on to the question of the quality of work. I mean, both from a child point of view, there's been emphasis, obviously, on parents having opportunities to move into work. And in you, Bill, obviously, you, you, I think you said a half of uh, disabled people of working age uh, yes. don't work. And, and obviously, you, 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 you're implying there that there's that many would actually want to work if they could. So I suppose there's two questions there. Is, I mean, one is, you know, what can we do about the, the in-work poverty? And that's a whole big issue for both of you, I'm sure. But also, I suppose, in terms of uh, inclusion in Scotland, I suppose uh, how um, a lot of the rhetoric, obviously, around welfare reform is that people can work and don't. And obviously, you, you're actually saying that's not the case at all. There's many mm -hmm. more people want to work and yeah. can't work. Yeah. So I suppose just a general comment on, on, on work in general with reference to... Uh, disabled people, but also just this whole issue about zero hours contracts in work poverty and what your priorities would be for action on those fronts? I mean, a lot more disabled people want to work than are currently in work. Um, there, I think currently it's 44% it's of Scottish disabled people are in, in employment. And most of the best estimates suggest that somewhere between 70 and 80% of disabled people with working age would actually like to be in work. Um, there are a number of disabled people who do not feel that they could work even if there were opportunities to do so and they tend to be people with the most profound level of impairment uh, etc um, and, and it would be wrong to try and dragoon them into work um, when they, they face multiple impairments etc but there are a lot more people who could work and um, work is therapeutic um, it uh, reduces social isolation, and that's as big a killer as cancer and heart disease. Um, so, again, you reduce healthcare costs um, by getting uh, disabled people into work. I don't think there's anybody in, in the disabled people's movement who's ever put the argument that we want to see less disabled people in work. Um, what we object to is, is really um, a set, an assessment regime that doesn't take the specific needs of the individual into account and address those needs in trying to help them find work. If the system was geared to doing that, then more disabled people would take up the opportunities. Some of them need to be given the self-confidence to do so because they've never worked and, you know, for maybe 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but they do, often do want to work part-time, you know, rather than full-time. Um, to see if they can cope with it, um, because they may have um, impairments. You know, they get fatigued or um, they cope you know, less well later in the day than they do uh, earlier in the day. And if those sort of things could, could be taken into account and people provided with support through schemes like Access to Work to get into work, as I said earlier, you begin to generate revenue that pay for the extra support that you're providing. And in that way, you get healthier disabled people, more of them in work, generating revenue, etc. It's, it's a, a very virtuous cycle. Um, and, and we need to begin to think that way. Um, so rather than punishing people for not making the move into work, we need to begin to support them to make that move. And I don't think that's happening at present. 
Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Malcolm. And we'll move on now to uh, Gavin Brown for the next question. Okay, there, thank you. Um, first question is one it's something that uh, Mr Hepburn touched on uh, regarding access to work. It's from your paper, Mr Scott. Um, I, I agree with you that, that finding out the answer to that question is, is quite important. What, what work have you done on it so far? I mean, are these, are these new figures that you've not had a chance to investigate, or have you kind of tried every avenue and you, you sort of feel you're banging your head against the wall and there well, just isn't an, an explanation? We've, we've asked the DWP for explanations, but they're not the sort of responses you get through an FOI. Um, so um, we, we keep tabs on it. We check regularly whether there you know, there have been uh, increases or not. Um, there are quarterly figures released. Mm. Um, I think those figures are perhaps from about six months ago, but I doubt if they've changed sure. you know, markedly um, in, in that time. Um, we have asked, I mean, we, again, we've made approaches through um, MPs at Westminster to try and find out why there's a, a disparity. Um, but there, there, there doesn't see, you know, there, there is no official explanation as sure. to why why that that disparity exists. Um, I, I don't think it's because the DWP are discriminate against Scots or anything. I, I, you know, I don't think it's anything like that. But I do. I'm an ex civil servant myself uh, and used to work in the Department of Employment way back in the 1980s. And I do know that um, sometimes in interpreting rules and regulations. Um, Scottish civil servants were sometimes um, more determined to do so. Um, uh, you know, I worked in unemployment benefit and we had higher rates of penalising people um, for not, being, uh, not actively seeking work than other areas of the UK. And it may be something of that. It may be something to do with the culture rather than um, you know, that the rules are different uh, here to elsewhere. Um, but the, the, there is a significant difference, and, and I think it would be worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not huge amounts of money. We're talking, you know, about 130, 140 million pounds a year, I think, uh, in total across the UK. Um, but you know, it makes a significant difference to disabled people's lives um, if they can get that support. And obviously, if there are less who are receiving it, then potentially that could impact on their being able to maintain themselves in employment and uh, so a less uh, rigorous regime might, might result in a few more disabled people getting into work and staying in work. Yeah. Okay. So the, I mean, there's, there's no official explanation but in terms of the stakeholders and, and service users that you speak to, I mean, it, other than the sort of um, you yeah. know, different interpretation by civil servants, is there anything any answer? Are you genuinely kind of scratching? It's, it's very difficult for us because we're, we're a, a Scottish-only organisation, oh. so it's difficult for us to compare uh, and contrast with other areas of the UK. But you know, um, talking to service users and uh, so they do feel that the rules are being interpreted very vigorously in Scotland as to you know whether you're entitled to support and then what support you're entitled to. And I do know, I mean. I, again, you have to give credit where credit's due. The DWP introduced um, a, a, a range of things that you were not going to get support with, including um, JAWS software, which basically um, reads um, on-screen information and renders it in, in, into a voice so that a, a blind or a person with visual impairment can, can read emails, uh, have them read to them. Um, and, and they stopped supplying that, and they stopped supplying special chairs for people with back problems and things like that. And they've relaxed that, and, and that's changed again this year. So we expect to see there will be a rise, hopefully, over the course of this year in uh, the amount of support that's being provided. Because although these were low expenditure items, about £800 for JAWS, I think, um, again, for a blind person or somebody whose uh, vision is deteriorating rapidly, um, they're absolutely essential in the modern day work office environment um, to be able to maintain your job. So, you know, I, I think it will, hopefully, we'll see a rise in the amounts being spent on access to work, including in Scotland. But I still think that disparity is probably, <laughs> probably going to be there. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, next issue, just uh, Mr. Dickey, in your, um, I think, first answer you said, I, th I think I've written it down right. 
you, you're looking for a significant shift in the tax and benefit system. And uh, I think you gave some examples of changes you wanted to see in the benefit system. If we focus on the shifts in the tax system that you'd like to see, I mean, I, I'm, I'm be interested in answers from, from both of you. Um, you have both touched on council tax, I think, um, either a change or, uh, I think in Mr Scott's case, ab abolition of it. Um, and you've also touched about investing more in tax collection um, and so on. Other than those two, though, in terms of significant shift in the tax system, um, are there other proposals that, that your organisations are um, pushing for? So a, 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 a greater balance, if, if it's accepted that um, there was need, to, you know, uh, the, the, the priority needed to be deficit, you know, at UK level deficit reduction, balancing the public finances, then a decision was made that that should come through 80 percent. Um, spending cuts uh, and 20% tax increases. So that's that a kind of political decision. The consequences of that are that those who are more reliant on uh, spending and um, on Social Security, which has seen one of the biggest uh, hits in terms of cuts to, to public spending, um, you know, bear, bear, bear the brunt of that policy. They're the ones that uh, have seen their incomes reduced uh, at, at the most as a result. So I suppose the most thing is looking at this as a sort of integrated rather than just looking at tax and just looking at benefit. This we have to look across the board. How does the tax and benefit system work together to um, ensure that um, resources and, 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 and income wealth is, is distributed in such, as a, such a way that ensures that those who uh, are on the lowest incomes are protected? Um, and I suppose also looking at how, we, how across the life course, this is not just kind of redistrib redistribution from them from the richer to, 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 to the poor or, or the less, less well off, um, but actually looking at the, the system and this is a way of collecting resources um, at, the, at that point and paying in at that point when we're able to, when we're working, we're, we're, we're contributing, and then drawing out at those points where we're looking after children when we're affected by ill health or disability uh, or, or, or old age. Um, so looking at the system more as a, an integrated package and the overall role that tax and benefits plays in um, reducing and protecting um, families from poverty, I suppose, would be the key thing we would look at in getting a better balance of um, when and the overall approach to public finances, a better balance between thinking about um, tax cuts as opposed to spending cuts or ta tax increases as opposed to... Is there, I mean, just on, that, on the specific point of the 80-20 of the split, so 80 per cent on uh, public spending reduction and 20 per cent tax, do, does your organisation have, have an official view on how that split... Ought, I mean, if you were controlling the, the purse strings, as it were, do, do you have a formal view on a percentage, or are you just saying it shouldn't be 80-20? It's a far fairer, far more even split, so we haven't, we're not, we're, you know, beyond what the work we've done to actually identify what that should be. Okay. Um, part of that should be thinking through, well, what are the consequences? What are the implications? I suppose it's, it's trying to apply a kind of child poverty, a poverty-proofing lens to those big... Um, public finance decisions that are, that are made about um, uh, 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 approach to t tax and benefits generally. And that, at the top of that should be, well, what, what are the implications of this for overall levels of poverty in our society? And, and, and obviously our particular focus on, on children. Um, uh, so what, 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 what's the impact in relation to child poverty? And then that would drive you in terms of, OK, well, what's, what's the best balance to get? Um, OK, th thank you. Um, last, last issue, very quick. Very, very, very quick. just very quickly, Mr Scott's paper, you talked about a couple of changes to the tax system, one is VAT and one is taxing on benefits, obviously they're in your written paper, is it possible just to uh, see them here so they're on the official record? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, we, you know, at, at present, Job Seekers Allowance, Carers Allowance and Employment Support Allowance, which one of the main benefits paid to disabled people, are all taxable income in the course of the year and, you know, the amount <laughs> that you have, actually get paid is, is minimal, but it does reduce um, any tax rebate that you may be due if you've lost your job. Um, and I, I just think it's, it's pretty parsimonious uh, in the government to, to whack that back off of people who have either become ill or, or unemployed, uh, and particularly towards carers as well, um, who are saving uh, the government billions uh, by pro providing unpaid care. Um, the VAT one, I think, it, again, is a, a really it's a poor example of how things are thought through. A disabled person that spends money to uh, adjust, adjust uh, their own house to their living needs 
reducing their so social care costs as a consequence. So, for, for example, by themselves paying for a stair lift or um, to uh, you know, install a wet room in, in, in their house so that they don't need help with bathing gets charged VAT on, on that work. And we just, we just think it's unfair um, because it, it, these are the needs of that person in their daily life um, rather than you know, improving the house um, for investment purposes. Um, so there should be some tax relief. Sorry. I'm yeah. sure you could expand yeah. on that more, yeah. but if you don't mind, yeah. uh, sure. leave it at that. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, so our next questions are from uh, Jean Urquhart. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Vice Convener. I wanted to ask, these topics of tax and spend, and, and both papers really, I think, give a very clear view of, of how you see the lie of the land just now. And I'm happy to accept the, the horrendous position that we find ourselves in. Um, I wanted to ask you, so just on a kind of different subject, about um, maybe the, the third sector and what I choose to call the fourth sector, which is when people do things for themselves. And um, my own experience in this job is, is much more in rural areas where, where I see incredibly good, strong um, groups of people actually just taking things into their own hands often and doing, uh, I think, really well in quite small communities. I don't have the, the same experience in kind of large areas, although I do know from uh, hearing evidence at other, other committees too that that's the case. Could, could you say how you see the best way forward for us to really make the investment at a local level where we can inspire people to, because I think they, they do it so well. I mean, if, if given half the chance uh, to how we, should, we, we can best make these investments, or even if you think that that's, it's worthy of note and that they, they, when communities actually are kind of liberated to make a change themselves and they get it, then they, they actually are almost more efficient and better at doing it. Whether it's the, the job centre, I think just as an example, Bill, you mentioned that most jobs come by word of mouth. People hear about a job and they go for it or somebody recommends uh, somebody that they know or a neighbour or a friend or whatever to get the job. And the job centre often is the place where people actually people don't go because it's not making it work for them. Yeah, um, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, you know, won't come as a surprise to John. Uh, uh, I worked in uh, uh, anti-poverty initiatives um, for a long time and uh, I do believe that people living in poverty often have the solutions at hand what they don't have the resources to actually make it work. And I, I do think that more power needs to be passed down uh, to local communities to deal with these things themselves. And, and I, again, I think that would be a good use of, of public funds is, is to invest in those communities, to allow them to, to generate the sort of life chances um, that would really make a difference. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think that's the case. That's one of the reasons, I mean, you know, disabled people in particular are in favour of independent living. It's often misunderstood as mean living on your own. Um, it, it doesn't mean that, or it, it means living a full life with the necessary support that a disabled person might need. Um, and if, if, if we could achieve that and reduce social isolation, because people can be even more isolated in a city than they are in, in a rural community, where, as you say, everybody tends to know one another and, and look after one another, whereas you can live next door to your neighbours and maybe never see them. Um, because they go out to work in the morning, come home in the evening, and, and there's no contact. Um, but you know, if you begin to generate something at a community level where people do look, you know, look in the right way into each other's lives and begin to help each other, then I, you know, I think it's got benefits all round. People feel good when, when they do good for other people, and it makes them feel better about their own lives as well as helping the other people. So, yeah. Invest in local communities, definitely. And, and would you see that being extended to things like childcare? If we were making the investment in, in 
in training and so on for people, but they decide, they make the decision about the hours, for example, that, that childcare is available. I mean, how else will we ever get it right for folk if they don't actually have that control? I, mean, I agree, and I think there's examples already of where community-based, you know, local people have come together, formed childcare provision, nurseries, creches, and, and developed it, and that's become integrated into the, wild, the wider childcare picture um, in, in, in their local area. So, uh, absolutely. I think other examples, you know, um, advice and information provision, which you know, emerges within local communities, and you have community-based advice and information services, um, peer-to-peer -peer kind of employability support that people, you know, again, just picking up on both what you and Bill said, very often the most effective way of engaging with people and supporting them is when people, people from their own communities, people with the same experiences uh, have had of unemployment, have been uh, cut out of the labour market, and when they're supported by somebody else who's had that experience themselves um, to, to make moves back into work, that can be most effective. I suppose it's about trying to identify what are the, stru what are the big structural barriers that prevent people, prevent more, you know, people actually, people, individuals and communities um, uh, from, from doing more of that. Uh, an example I'm thinking of recently did some work um, with the um, Poverty Truth Commission in Glasgow and speaking to some of the, um, the, 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 the people there, a woman who was involved in a local community group um, I can't remember exactly what it was, it was to do with. I think it might have been to do with. I can't remember exactly. But it involved in doing. It started off as volunteer work, developing skills. Um, they were. They had an idea of turning this into a local business, uh, and then she was unable to continue with that because she was pulled back into a work program or, uh, you know, the, uh, an, an, an official employment program that meant she didn't have the time to be investing in something that actually seemed to be working, was just beginning to flower and beginning to flourish. So I think having more within the, um, our mainstream um, employment and benefit services that actually recognises some of the really uh, valuable voluntary uh, work and that could emerge and could develop into um, potential small businesses and enterprises at local level. Um, so, so, so removing some of those barriers that, uh, that prevent that happening more needs to be at the heart of this. And then the other thing I think is it's very hard for as individuals and communities come under increasing pressure and, and the loss of income, you know, families facing real crisis where they're just struggling to get by day to day to, to pay, for, pay for food for the week ahead, to buy, um, to pay their energy bills, to buy, um, you know, to, 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 pay, to pay their bills, makes it much harder to um, have the time, the energy and the uh, personal capacity and resources to invest in the kind of local solutions um, that you're describing. So we need to remove barriers and we also need to assure, ensure that at a kind of national structural level that we're actually, that individuals and communities have the basic resources they need that then allow them to, on top of that, develop um, uh, and flourish and um, develop their own solutions to, to the situations to, 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 in terms of long-term uh, tackling poverty in their area. Thank you. Are you okay? Thank you. Thanks, Jean. That's great. And a final set of questions from Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, uh, going back to uh, the paper from CPAG, looking at paragraph 1.2.3, where it's stated, uh, uh, referring to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, uh, and it now forecasts uh, that as a result of current UK government tax and benefits policy, there will be massive rises in poverty in the coming years. In Scotland alone, up to 100,000 more children will be pushed into poverty by 2020. And in terms of our discussion already this morning, um, what seems clear is that um, when we look at that stark statement, uh, behind that lies a whole tale of lost opportunity, loss of lifetime uh, chances, loss of potential. Can I ask if there's been any thought in how that can be measured? Yes, I mean, that, 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 I think I referred earlier on that as well as measuring the improved incomes and the improved the reductions in child poverty, there was also analysis that looked at improvements in child well-being and you know, the overall impact of that as we saw the UK's relative position in terms of uh, UNICEF child well-being indexes and um, well-being of children in, across the UK and Scotland across the SQ improved significantly as the incomes of our lowest income families improved. Now, clearly, 
I think the reverse of that is now, is now unfortunately likely, that as more and more families are, are pushed back into poverty and more and more children grow up in families um, with inadequate incomes, that the reverse is that is likely to be the case. So we're going to see, we, we know the damage that, that, that poverty does to children in terms, of, um, in terms of health, in terms of their ability to get the most out of the school day, in terms of the lost opportunities out with school, informal opportunities, um, you know, holidays, visits to museums, visits to friends and families, the things that give you all the kind of um, uh, experience um, that, that, that helps uh, d develop your, your, your overall um, education more generally as well as at school, uh, all of these are damaged when families don't have adequate income. So um, I don't think there's any question that we're, we're likely to see um, you know, a, a, a negative impact on children's health and children's education on their overall well-being as more of them are pushed back into, in, in, into poverty. Can I ask, uh, Bill, what, in terms of yeah. specifically sorry, of yeah. disabled children, yeah. uh, because also there's additional issues yeah. there, of course. I mean, we know that health of anyone is affected by their feelings of well-being and self-esteem. Um, how they view themselves and how the rest of society views them impacts not just on um, you know, their mental health, their, their, um, whether they, you know, they get depressed or not. It actually impacts on their physical health. And it, you, know, you see a much higher prevalence of heart disease and cancer and, and an inability to recover from those when, when they occur. Um, and you know, that is to do with how the body is affected by our, our, how we feel about ourselves. So we know that children living in poverty suffer from low self-esteem. Um, and this is one of the things that's misunderstood about relative poverty as compared to absolute poverty. We look at the situation today and people in my parents' generation will say, but things aren't as bad as they were in the 1930s. And in absolute terms, they're right. Absolute poverty was greater then. But the problem with the relative poverty is it has a much more insidious effect on children and their life, later life expectancy. It affects their self-esteem for the rest of their lives and it therefore reduces their life expectancy. And it, you know, because they are more likely to be unhealthy, they're less likely to achieve at school. They're less likely to achieve at school, they're less likely to get the qualifications they need to enter further education, higher education. They're less likely to get a job. Because one of the requirements of a modern society is those pieces of paper, the qualifications. So, you know, at every stage of the life journey, you know, children, but particularly disabled children, who already start with a deficit model, as it, you know, within our societies, they're already seen as different and other to other children. They've already got issues with their self-esteem because of the discrimination that exists in our society. That impacts on them to an even greater extent. And, you know, one of the strangest things is that children from, you know, disabled children at age 16 have the same life expectations in terms of what they're looking for from their lives as other children. But by age 25, they think nothing will change their life and nothing will change it for the better. And, you know, that loss of hope that, you know, we impose on disabled children after they leave school is... is, is I think, the, you know, a huge, huge factor. In, uh, and so few of them being in employment and so few of them uh, thriving within uh, modern society. Just to come back, I think it's also important. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty bleak picture. I mean, I think that's the reality in terms of current uh, tax and benefit policy and the impact on, on child poverty. But I think it's also important that we get, don't get too, you know, um, you know, yeah. There are things we can be doing, yeah. uh, and that was one of our the key things that, at CPAG at the moment we're doing is trying to collect um, evidence from the range of casework support and the, from the advisors we support and work with across Scotland about how, how, how you know how, how are changes in the benefit system and, and, and the welfare system impacting on families um, in a bit more detail, and then trying to what are the, what are the lessons there for the way that local services and Scottish devolved national services here, here, here in Scotland are delivered that can help to um, take account of the reality that families, you know, you know, our lowest income families do just have less resources, have less money and will have less money in, in the years ahead if, if current policy continues. Um, and there are things that can, can be done in terms of, and we've talked about 
in terms of social care, thinking about the charging around social care, in terms of thinking about in the school, the school during the school day, how do we remove some of the charges for school materials, school trips, school activities, school meals. There's a whole lot of costs there that are, that, that, that are an additional burden on, on families that we can look at trying to remove. Um, how we look at some of those transport costs that families face that uh, could potentially be identified and, and, and addressed within existing powers here in Scotland. So, Yes, it's a bleak picture, but it shouldn't be one that kind of um, leads us to sort of, well, there's nothing we can do. There, there are things we, we, we can and must do um, within existing powers and wherever powers lie um, after this year uh, in order to address the consequences and support families uh, and ensure that we're not reinforcing um, problems created by the reality of, 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 of you know, the, the lower incomes are going I'd, to be faced with going I'd, ahead. I'd agree very much with John. Having painted a very big picture, we also know that interventions can change people's view of themselves and boost their self-esteem. And that can, again, have lifelong long consequences in terms of going on to, to achieve things in their lives, which they believed maybe five or ten years before they could never do. So, you know, you can, you can boost people's self-confidence um, if, if you make the right interventions. And... Uh, you know, we shouldn't be writing off those children. We should just be saying, this will happen unless we do something. But we know what we need to do. Can I say, I mean, going back to earlier discussions, I think it was John who said that obviously the, the, the big tax and benefit levers do lie currently at the UK government level. And obviously, uh, within that, one can try to do the best one can. But, I mean, if you don't control... The, the policy levers, the fundamental policy levers, would you not accept then that that adds a, a, acts as a constraint uh, uh, on what you can do? If you don't control the fundamentals, if somebody else does, uh, you, you don't have the same ability uh, to really uh, tackle the, the underlying problems. Well, clearly, depending where powers lie, different levels of government have different powers that they can use to, to tackle those. Um, I mean, our, our job is, you know, whatever powers lie, to be making the case for a, a different approach to tax and benefit policy, to labour market policy, but also to, um, you know, education, to health, to, to, to housing, um, to ensure that we're um, doing everything at every possible level to um, maximise the incomes of our lowest, poorest families, Create, maximise the opportunities um, children in Scotland have, um, and I suppose that's that, that's our approach. And you know, different challenges arise um, depending where those, those 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 powers end up end up lying. Uh, presumably, though, it, it would at least be possible for an independent Scotland with those powers to change what appears to be to have a certain inevitability in terms of outcome in terms of the IFS forecast at least for 2020, there seems to be a certain inevitability about the loss of lifetime chances, which for me is an unacceptable cost. Uh, and presumably, therefore, at least uh, an independent Scotland would have the opportunity uh, with the powers, the key fundamental levers, to do something different. Yeah, I, mean, I think the, I, there's no question the, referendum, this, the, the debate about the future of Scotland and where powers end up lying, for us, creates an opportunity to be, um, you know, generating the public support, identifying what the issues are, generating the public support, increasing the political will so that wherever those powers end up lying after 2014, they would be used in a way that would be more in line with the principles and the approach that we've hopefully outlined in our paper in terms of the approach that should be taken towards the public finances. Um, and that, that's the opportunity that's then up to the people to decide where those powers lie. I suppose for us, the key issue is how then are those powers used and Wherever they end up, there'll be a challenge for us, I think, in terms of uh, you know, ensuring that there is that public support, that there is that political will to uh, ensure that we generate the resources, that we gather the resources from what is a wealthy country, will be a wealthy country, whichever way things go. How do we um, ensure that those resources are, are used and our tax system uh, ensures that we gather those resources and our social security and our spending policies are used in such a way that we spend those resources uh, to ensure that all our children... Um, have a decent start in life and don't have to um, suffer the consequences of the, the levels of poverty that they have up until now. Um, we have no position on independence as an organisation. Um, I, I, I very much echo what John said. Wherever the power lies, we have to be making the arguments that it needs to be used differently. Um, whether it's an independent Scotland with full fiscal powers, whether it's um, 
Devo Max, you know, we increase powers to the Scottish Parliament. If those powers that are increased happen to include some of the fiscal powers that we're talking about, then yeah, we would be arguing that they, they should be used in that way. And if it's the state's goal, we will have to continue to argue with Westminster that a different approach needs to be made. Um, because we haven't got a tax and benefit system that, that works in concert with one another to, to maximise incomes for those that are least well off, because redistribution can happen through both methods, not just one. And it, you know, We've given a few examples of uh, tax hits on low-income people. One of the ones, there's actually been a, a recent um, tax change for small businesses, where the uh, first £2,000 uh, 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 national insurance for employers, they, they're not having to pay it. But disabled people who employ personal assistance are not included in that tax change. And that's, you know, disabled people already have higher living costs. We know that. And we're saying to them, but part of the, those monies that you do get, we're expecting you to pay employers' national insurance contributions for your employees, even though other small businesses are exempt. And, I, you know, again, I, I can't understand the reasoning for that because this is to only allow a disabled person to just do what everybody else does when they get up in the morning. Um, uh, thanks very much. Thank I'm afraid we have fully used up our time, and I do thank my colleagues for being disciplined. I, I do thank the two witnesses, Mr Dickey and Mr Scott, very much uh, for your answers. I think some of these issues we could have probably gone on uh, longer, but uh, there we go. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we shall start again at 10.55 uh, to allow a break and a change of witnesses.
OK, folks, well, welcome back uh, and uh, welcome to especially to uh, Susan Rice and Campbell Leith. Our next item of business is to take evidence from two of the Scottish Government's nominees for appointment to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. We will hear from the third nominee at next week's uh, meeting. Members have received copies of CVs and completed questionnaires from the nominees uh, from whom we will hear today. Uh, so we do welcome to the meeting Lady Susan Rice and Professor Campbell Leith. And I'd like to invite both of our candidates to make an opening statement. I don't know if you've decided amongst yourselves who's going first. Thank you. <laughs> no, we hadn't. Uh, well, good, good morning, and thank you very much for inviting both of us to this session to consider our nomination to the new Scottish Fiscal Commission, in my case, as potentially the chair. I'm aware that for some months now, the Finance Committee has taken testimony from a wide range of people in order to develop its own view about the creation of a fiscal commission, which I understand you support, as do others in Holyrood. Over a number of days rather than a number of months, I've read through much of the testimony you collected from your witnesses, and I have no doubt that if I read it a second time, I'd gain even more knowledge from it. Uh, you've certainly been thorough, wide-reaching in that activity, and some of that testimony, I think, has also begun to help me form my own thinking, so it's been useful in that regard. I noticed in particular a couple of words which were used with probably greater frequency than any others right across those different sessions. The words were independence with a lowercase i and uh, transparency. And I'd like to say something about each of those in general in relation to myself and then add two words to that mix. To be genuinely effective, I believe the Fiscal Commission needs to be trusted for the work it does, the way it does it, and for its overarching commitment to the public good. But trust isn't something that individuals bring to the table themselves. Trust is something that has to be earned. It has to be bestowed by others. And I believe that a Fiscal Commission whose members are in fact and perceive both, in fact, and perceived to be independent, independent of political, personal, and professional agendas, and whose work is done as transparently as possible, will go a long way to winning public trust. So I was glad to see those two words mentioned so frequently. In relation to myself, I can confirm that I have no conflicts that should interfere with the perception or the fact of my own independence. Regarding transparency, over the years, I've come to value greatly doing things that way. There's huge value of a wider audience understanding what you're doing as you do it and of being clear enough yourself that you can explain your activities to a wide audience. I would perhaps add two words to independence and transparency in their challenge and competence. Challenge because I've learned over a long career that the best ideas, the best plans are made even better when others who represent diverse perspectives challenge those ideas in their formative stages and right through their development, of course doing so constructively. Particularly in my board director roles, I'm expected to provide challenge at all levels and of all parties within the relevant organization. And competence, perhaps that's a given, but it never should be, even with all the best ways of working, including transparency and challenge and independence, the output will not be sufficient if those who are producing it lack a high level of competence, but I'm sure you have that in mind. I'm honored to have had my name put forward as the potential chair of the new Scottish Fiscal Commission. I have quite a lot of experience in helping create new entities, and I thoroughly enjoy that. This is a very important step for Scotland, one not to be taken lightly. It will require undoubtedly hard work, focus, widespread engagement with a range of stakeholders, and perhaps a bit of wisdom. I would bring to bear knowledge of the business and financial climate, a personal style of constant learning and asking questions, the rigor of my early scientific training. Also extensive experience as a board director, chairmanship of a range of bodies, and a fierce desire to try to make a success of anything I'm involved with. Finally, I was brought up to embrace a public service motive and have done so in many ways over many years. If my appointment is approved, I would look forward to working hard to create something brand new for this country and genuinely important in seeing that it operates to the highest standards. It would be a great privilege to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Leith. Well, uh, first, I fully agree with everything Lady Rice has, has said. Uh, I would really just like to make three, briefly, three points. Uh, the first is, well, as an academic whose work has been mainly focused on looking at optimal policy design, macro policy design, and the design of institutions to support that, that optimal policy, it, it really is an honour to be asked to be involved in setting up a fiscal commission for Scotland and you know, seeing these, these ideas actually implemented. 
The second thing uh, is that I was struck when reading the documentation associated with the decision to create the Fiscal Commission and in the discussions we had when I previously gave evidence to the committee, uh, the degree of consensus that has been built around the creation of the, of the Fiscal Commission for Scotland and also the, the key properties it, it must have. Like Lady Rice, I, I, I saw the words non-partisan, independence, transparency coming up time and time again in, in the documentation uh, supporting the creation of the Fiscal Commission. Uh, yeah, and the way the Commission is being created reflects that with fixed term appointments and so on, re reflects the need to, to achieve these, these goals. But again, in order to have it fully realised, it has to be embodied within the, the people serving on the Commission itself. And as potentially a, a member of the Commission, uh, I recognise uh, very deeply how important it is that the, the Commission has those elements. It is independent, it is transparent. And, you know, my actions and where I to serve in the Commission would be to fully support that. The final, final point I want to make is that, well, in terms of the operation of the Fiscal Commission, the, the practical logistics of it, uh, this is something that really needs to be discussed amongst the, the Fiscal Commission itself. If it, once appointed, they need to meet and have dialogue with all the, the relevant bodies. However, what, one thing I thought it might be important to note is that while we would hope that the Fiscal Commission Commission helps improve the, the forecasting uh, of the Scottish Government forecasters. Forecasting is still an inherently difficult process and forecasts will still be wrong no matter how good the Fiscal Commission is. Uh, so um, a large part of the scrutiny that the Fiscal Commission has to offer is, is, is not just of the, of the headline number that's produced but it's the whole process of forecasting, it's the whole method of forecasting. It's, and it's not just in the heat of the moment round about the draft budget publication that the Fiscal Commission may do its work. It may have spread that work throughout the year, scrutinising the modelling that's being done, the, how that can be improved, and, and engage with the Scottish Government forecasters on a, on a more continuous basis. So, that's that. the three okay, well, to thanks very much to both of you for uh, making these points and for being uh, to the point. So I'll ask a couple of questions and then uh, colleagues can come in. Uh, with questions as well. You've, you've both touched on independence, and you're right in saying that that's been very much to the fore of the committee's thinking uh, as we've looked at this whole subject. I mean, is the key to independence having the system correct and the right checks and balances, or, or is it just down to the individuals that the individuals have the right attitude who are on the Fiscal Commission? I'll go first again, if that's OK. <laughs> um, Campbell and I have just met, so we need to work out how to work together. Uh, yeah. um, I think it's both. I think, in fact, if you ask, is the key, I think there are two keys. I think the, the nature of the appointments process, I'm not very much welcomed uh, the notion that uh, our names would be recommended to this committee, and if you um, thought we were suitable, you would recommend us to the wider Parliament. I think that's very important. That creates a, um, a degree of responsibility uh, and keeps us mindful, uh, whatever pressures might come along day by day, um, that we have that, that greater uh, responsibility. I think that's really important. But at the end of the day, it is also how we ourselves conduct ourselves. And I think it has to do with, with our past conduct as well as our future conduct. Uh, we need to be seen as being um, uh, independent uh, in what we do. And also uh, in, in positions where there's, there's no potential gain from, you know, I'm not trying to build my CV, unfortunately, you, I think you've seen it, it's dreadfully long. Um, and so, so I wouldn't see that I was gaining something personally. This, for me, would be purely a matter of public service, of wanting to engage in something that is hugely important and a, at a very exciting time. So I think that is what helps the independence. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, essentially, I, I agree. I mean, we discussed the various me formal mechanisms that can help ensure well, can facilitate independence, but they don't ensure independence. The independence comes from the, the behaviour of the, the members of the Commission. And, you know, well, I, I've worked in this area for a long time, and the, the Commission only has a value if it is independent. So, uh, and, you know, I, I want the Commission to succeed. So I, I buy into the, the notion of independence wholeheartedly for the Commission, and, you know, I, I would work to ensure that that was maintained. 
Okay, thank you. I mean, we, we spent a bit of time discussing, you know, is the Commission answerable primarily to the Parliament or to the Government or to both? I mean, do you see any tensions in there that, uh, you know, between your relationship with the Government and your relationship with the Parliament? Um, it, not, not necessarily and intrinsically, if we all operate properly. You could, you could create a scenario possibly where there might be, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, as I said, I welcome the idea that we're answerable to the Parliament. Uh, that is, it, it, it's a public form of, of, of responsiveness. Uh, I think that's what really matters here. We would obviously have dealings with, um, with the civil servants uh, who work on economic modeling for the government and with, with, the, with the government um, itself. But it, by, by creating this route to the Parliament, I think that uh, gives us the means to stay above undue uh, influence. And, or the influence that one wouldn't want. And my understanding is that, that the government is very keen for that to happen as well. They want this body to be seen uh, as independent. Um, if, if challenges arose, we deal with them. That happens in life all the time. Uh, it happens in, you know, in my business life all the time, in which case you, you address them. But I think the ultimate route back to parliament is the one that had, takes primacy in all of this. I mean, you don't have to comment as well, Professor. Uh, yeah, just, I, I, I think there's examples of, of both uh, in fiscal councils throughout the world. It, it's not obvious that one dominates the other. So, again, it's, it, it's, it's how we behave that ultimately matters. That's okay. I mean, I mean, one of the things that struck me, Ms Rice, uh, was when you talked about being able to explain, I think, explain the Commission. And I, I was just thinking... Is that to the Parliament and the government, or is it to the wider public? I mean, does the wider public need to know about this commission, or just needs to know it exists, or do you think the wider public is going to be really getting to know the organisation very well? I suspect the broadest definition of the wider public will not get to know the organization very well, but I think there will be people and members in the, in the wider public who might be interested. I think any business that goes before Parliament is potentially of interest to, uh, to others that go beyond those who are ele elected to, uh, to Holyrood. Uh, so um, when I talk about explaining something, what I mean is that uh, in an area which can be highly technical, um, the ability to put into fairly plain language to express and communicate what you're doing or what the decisions are or why in a way that um, people like me uh, can understand, if you see what I mean, that you know, ordinary people can understand, I think that's really important because I think that speaks to your own grasp of what it is you're doing. Um, people who can only explain technical things in highly technical terms don't always actually understand it. So that's why I mentioned that. I think there will be interest uh, more broadly. Uh, I think, again, because things are new here. The new um, taxes that are being devolved in the Scotland 2012 Act to start uh, in the next year, that's new. And there may be people who want to see, well, what does this really mean? How, does, how, does this, how is this working? I hope they would be reassured by the existence of this Scottish Fiscal Commission. Thank you. Yep. Certainly for, for, for full-scale fiscal councils acting in you know, independent countries, part of the objective of the Fiscal Council is to, is to add credibility to the policy-making process. Uh, and and you, would you would want you know, people making big economic decisions out there in the wider economy to, to understand what the Fiscal Council is doing, what credibility it's lending, what credibility it's not lending. So you, you would hope that its work does, does get out there. At the moment, for the Fiscal Commission for Scotland, its remit is rather more limited, so that kind of wider credibility issue affecting wider scale economic decision making is, is maybe not so important at this point. Yeah, that's great, thanks very much. Uh, so the next questions are going to come from Malcolm Chisholm. Yeah, you referred there, Professor Leith, to a, a kind of a narrower remit than perhaps exists in some other countries, and also perhaps narrower than some of the people who gave us evidence were suggesting, for example, um, Jeremy Peat and, and David Bell. I wondered whether, in fact, that is a disappointment to you. I noticed your work was around optimal policy design, so I, I kind of just wonder whether you're going to be slightly frustrated, both of you, in fact, by the narrow remit, or do you think there is scope uh, for more to be done in terms of analysis um, beyond your sort of fairly narrow remit, as it were? Uh, well, I think... Well, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're still juggling. Uh, I think for, for me at the moment, the, 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 what the Fiscal Commission is, is doing, given the current state of devolved uh, powers, is it's, 
it's kind of opening up elements of the forecasting process within the Scottish Government to scrutiny and transparency. And, uh, and it, it's changing the culture that's producing those those forecasts, in a sense. So that, that's where its value lies at the moment. Uh, at the moment. For, for me, a, a critical kind of change in how the Fiscal Commission would have to operate would be should the Scottish Government have significant debt issuance powers. Uh, and then it becomes more like the full-scale Fiscal Commissions or Fiscal Councils we see throughout the world. So it, it's once if and when that power is granted that the Fiscal Commission has to transform itself and really move up a gear and, and do something quite different. Do you want to come in? Yes, <laughs> yeah. We can yeah. keep the Mutt and Jeff thing going here. Um, I, I think I commented in my responses to your questions that I think it's quite right for this to start off in this small and contained way. Uh, and the reason I say that is that I've, uh, as I mentioned before, have, have in, in my professional life um, helped to create lots of new entities, organizations, committees, boards, whatever it is. And the thing to make that work successfully is to get started. And I think you get started if you have a defined remit, you know what you're doing, it's not too big, we're not trying to do everything all at once. Let's get this up, let's get it running, which I think is, is your, um, your guidance uh, by doing it uh, this year. And then as times and matters change, the remit may grow and we'll be in a much better position to, um, to expand or reshape or change if that's needed. Well, that's interesting. So, in a kind of way, I take it you're both saying that it could evolve uh, given further fiscal um, responsibilities for Scotland, yeah. either under devolution or independence. I mean, the issue of independence with a small eye has already been uh, touched on by the convener. I, I wonder if um, you foresee any potential areas of difficulties in, in your dealings with the government and Revenue Scotland, and you think, and how do you feel the memorandum of understanding should prepare for any conflicts? between the three, from the three bodies? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll say that um, I have not really had personal dealings with Revenue Scotland, so it's very hard for me to, uh, you know, but obviously I would develop that relationship uh, if I took on this role. Um, I think the memorandum of understanding is really important, and I think a full and frank discussion around a table with the members of the Commission and those with whom we'd be dealing um, would be the start point uh, to talk about where potential uh, issues, strains, conflicts might come up to help each other understand fully what the remit, what the boundaries are, what the expectations are. Uh, and I think the memorandum of understanding is a very, very early step in the, the creation of the Fiscal Commission. I suspect that it would not be um, the draft that is agreed initially might not be the final draft. I mean, I think these things evolve over time as well. You have to work, you have to rub elbows together in a sense, because sometimes you don't anticipate points of tension, and, and if those develop, you need a good personal relationship in order to raise them, address them, and deal with them. Uh, yes, uh, okay. I agree. Um, Professor Leith, you point out that it might be desirable to avoid the Commission's work being concentrated in a very short period prior to each uh, forecast round. I think I'm quoting you here. This would then spread the scrutiny work throughout the year and enable the Fiscal Commission to undertake some limited longer-term research work. Um, I suppose my question really is to do with, um, do you have the, the, the capacity uh, to carry out this approach and, and you know, would, you, would you seek to engage a wider range of people in your work or do you feel working on an ongoing basis, as you suggest, would be quite manageable uh, for you given your other responsibilities? Yeah, it was, given the, the remit of, of the Fiscal Commission is, is quite tightly defined at the moment, it's, it really depends, once we get into the nitty gritty as to you know, how the Scottish Government is actually producing these forecasts once we get access to the models, the modelling work that underpins it all. Uh, once we see that, then you know, individual elements of that may, it may become apparent that certain elements of that modelling work are, are, are more material than others and inducing sensitivity in the forecasts to some assumptions and so on. So those might be areas where you want to undertake some limited research work to see if that part of the forecasting process can be made more robust or, or, or just generally in our scrutiny work. Uh, you know, those the underlying assumptions about the projections of house prices, uh, 
underpinning some of these tax revenue forecasts. So you may want to do some research work looking at the literature on forecasting house prices and how that compares with the Scottish Government's approach. So given the, the, the research budget and, and the time constraints we all face, it's necessarily going to be quite limited our ability to do that. But you know, to, to the extent that it's possible, I think that would be a useful way to just have an ongoing relationship with the forecasters. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. And the uh, next person to ask questions is Jean Urquhart. Uh, thank you. Um, Lady Rice, in answer to question three, um, you, uh, you're answering on the operational, uh, the operation of the, of the SFC, and you say that it will require a lot of data, a lot of information. It will need the expertise to analyse the economic models. It will need information on wider economic factors. It will likely need to identify a small, a small cohort of skilled individuals and so on. Um, when we took evidence uh, earlier, last week or the week before, Jeremy Peat was concerned about the, the small budget that's been made available. And I, I wonder if, if, that, if that's an issue here, just given the kind of... Uh, support that this group, you know, three people can do so much, but the backup clearly is going to be really important. Do you think the budget is sufficient? Uh, in a way, it, it's, it's hard to give an absolute yes or no answer to that. Um, there are two ways to respond to some of these questions. One would be fiscal commission as one conceives it to develop into, you know, what it might be. And the other is where we start off. I think the proposed £20,000 budget is where we begin. Um, and the remit, as uh, Campbell has stated, is quite uh, restricted in this, this, you know, the very few first few months. Um, when I say that we would need all of this other, I perhaps should have used the word, we will likely, I don't know what we need until we get going, to be very honest, but, but the anticipation was we would need to turn to some experts or some expertise to support the work that um, three of us alone probably could not satisfactorily uh, achieve. Um, I think £20,000 is something to get started with. Um, I come from a, uh, a background where uh, every penny counts, and so I'm not uh, one to spend much. And having a public sector experience through my association with the Bank of England, um, I'm very conscious of value for money. So I mean, I think the pennies would be spent wisely. If one needed more, for some reason, we'd have to speak up. And over time, as it developed, we might well need more. I think the fact that the commission is, is planned to be hosted at the University of Glasgow and the University of Glasgow has indicated that they will support the, the commission's work may help that 20,000 go a bit further than it would if you were just commissioning research from outside organisations. Thank you. Um, and just one other thing. I, I, wonder, I think you mentioned as you, as you came in that you've just met. Um, I was just going to ask you if, uh, if you clearly know of each other's work. I mean, uh, Professor Leith, you've contributed and written extensively. Um, and I wonder if Lady Rice knows of, 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 of what you've written and if you will provide a challenge to each other or are you uh, similar thinking along similar lines economically? <clears throat> um, so the, the, the simple answer is um, I've known Professor Leith a bit by reputation. I uh, am not an economist uh, in, in my own right, and I don't follow um, sort of economic papers. To some extent, I do actually, as they've related to my role with the Bank of England, where I need to be very focused on, uh, on economic matters and hear lots of reports and read lots of information. Um, so... I, and some of that may be from yourself, but I might not have registered that I was reading your work, so I can't say that uh, we share a perspective or not, to be, to be very honest. Um, but you asked the important question, which is one of challenge or uh, groupthink, to use a bit of, uh, of today's jargon. Uh, challenge, and I, I mentioned that in my opening comments, absolutely essential. I mean, that, that is what this is about, because you come out to a better place when you can challenge each other. Um, I don't know if we share economic views, but because I'm not an academic, 
academic and an academic economist, I won't necessarily look at the world in the same way. I think that's um, perhaps an advantage, that what I bring to the table is a pretty deep knowledge of the business environment and, and, uh, and the consumer world and um, the financial uh, climate. And um, I have no difficulty, in fact, this has almost become a trademark of my style, of asking um, what I call the daft lassie as opposed to daft laddie questions. I think um, that brings out uh, a lot of good information. I would also say that challenge isn't necessarily finger-pointing aggression at all. Uh, challenge is, is actual challenge, is exploring, is, is say, help me understand it in this context and that. And I think you come out to a better place. So I have no problem with the concept of challenge, whether or not I find I agree with you, and I don't know yet. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a kind of quantitative macroeconomist, but with no strong ideological bias, the way some economists sometimes have. Uh, so really, I, I want to get my hands in the model and the data and, and see how that's working, and that's the contribution I think I would make. So that's the... Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jean, very much. Uh, Jamie Hepburn's next. Thank you, uh, convener. Just a, a couple of questions, and I, I was struck very much, Ms. Uh, Rice, by the uh, the fact you've said a couple of times now that you're driven by a, a public service ethos. I think you said you were brought up with this, and um, you're driven to serve on this commission by that uh, sense of public service, and uh, it's also reflected in your your uh, written paper in terms of some of the other positions you've taken up. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Why this? idea of public service ethos is important to you? Um, I, I literally was brought up with that notion. Um, now, obviously, I was brought up in, in a country other than this, which you'll either know or you can tell from my accent. Um, but it, it was simply that, um, but, but, but it, it was a country, America, made up of, um, uh, at least in the last century, and continues in some ways, uh, huge immigrant populations. And um, so my grandparents were immigrants to America. And so I was brought up with the notion that if you know, life has not treated you dismally, that if, if, you know, if things have gone reasonably well, you have an obligation to give back somehow, to find a way to give back. That's just a mantra that, that I was raised with. Um, I had uh, relatives who did various things uh, of that sort. We don't do what we do in isolation or for ourselves. I mean, we, we obviously have lots of kind of communities or circles around us. Sometimes it's family and those close to us, sometimes literally our physical community. But we are part of a bigger society. And, um, and there's something about, uh, about justice and fairness um, that just part of my psyche, uh, I was brought up with that. And, um, and it feels very natural to, to want to do something of the sort. I am just completing seven years as a director of the Bank of England, um, um, which is quite a notable institution, um, hugely um, demanding amount of workload, um, fascinating, a great privilege to have done that, and certainly public service in, in every sense of the word. Um, and so for me, the timing of this actually works very well because I would be keen to continue to feel I was giving something, and especially here in Scotland, which is my home. And this is what you want to bring to the table in terms of, of this role. This is what drives you to, to, to take up this challenge. Well, it, it, it's, it's one thing. I mean, it, one is just the... Um, uh, I mentioned... Uh, creating new things. I mean, I'm, I'm excited by the, the detail of actually making this work and putting it together and testing myself and, and learning. Um, because it, it's all about learning. It will be especially for myself. Um, uh, you know, all of those things are, are the things that... that that interest me. So there are a lot of reasons for doing it. I think it's important. I think, and I've said, used the word important several times. It, this is an important uh, undertaking. I believe it's the right one and it's a good one. And I'd like to uh, help, you know, with others because you don't do something yourself. Um, make it happen. Thank you. And Professor Leith, in your paper that you made an interesting point, and I think I recall you, you making a similar point previously to us, uh, you made a point in your uh, discipline and, and academia uh, generally that uh, uh, the integrity of, this is what you say in your paper, the integrity of research is maintained by the peer uh, review uh, process and also by ensuring other researchers have access to sufficient information to enable them to replicate the findings of published studies and you say that you believe that following this uh, approach as far as practically possible in relation to the work of the Commission is, is a, a, a good thing. So I suppose it begets the question, who are the peers of the Fiscal Commission. 
uh, to review our work. Um, yeah, well, I guess our commentary is, will be published, will be scrutinised by anyone that chooses to scrutinise it. Uh, it may also not be a bad idea to have periodic reviews by you know, other fiscal commissions, other academics, other non-academics who are, uh, look at the quality of the commentary that's being offered by the fiscal commission. Yeah, well, that seems a, a reasonable thing to do. I suppose as your general point that you should be transparent and information is there for yep. your peers, whether they exist or not, to, to, to be able to access that information. Yes, that's if they're the interested in doing it, they can. Yes, that's, that's the kind of gold standard, is that you, you should be able to, when academics do research, it used to be the case that you would publish the paper and then it would be a really hard slog to try and replicate what was done in that paper. Uh, these days, with electronic resources available, you, you put all the computer code, all the data up there and someone could just take it off the shelf and, and see where the results were coming from and change things and do robustness checks. And, the more you do that, the more you ensure that the original research is of high standard and no corners were cut. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, Gavin Brown is next. Uh, thank you. Um, Lady Rice, just want to touch on question five of the questionnaire. Uh, do you hold any other roles which might give rise to or be, or be perceived as being a potential conflict of interest? Now, my question is this. You sit on the Council of Economic Advisers at the moment, and looking at their remit, they've got three key themes on which to advise the government, one of which is economic levers. So you've got an advisory role on economic levers. On the Scottish Fiscal Commission, there would obviously be a challenge function, again, on the application of those economic levers. So how do you avoid the perception of a conflict of interest between those two very different roles? Um, and I've given a good deal of thought to that, uh, and um, I would, if I felt that there was a conflict of interest that developed, I would simply deal with it. I think that um, the, the role chairing the Fiscal Commission is the role that would, again, take primacy in, in this instance. Uh, and, um, and I would, would see how that, uh, how that goes. I mean, what I add to the discussions at the Council of Economic Advisors, again, draws on my, my business knowledge, my knowledge of our markets here in Scotland, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, it, we don't uh, develop policy in those discussions, uh, you know, in, in any specific way. But if there was a conflict, it would have to be, be addressed, uh, you know, pure and simple. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. Sure, to no, you. I, I, I just, I mean, but you, you, your intention, as it stands, is to remain on the Council of Economic Advisers. Uh, uh, your intention is to do both roles? My intention right now is to do both roles, roles unless there is an issue. Um, and uh, quite honestly, um, the fact that I'm sitting here, or that I knew I would be sitting here, is only a matter of a couple of weeks or days old. So I haven't um, actually thought through or spoken to anyone uh, in, in, with regard to the Council of Economic Advisors. But if that was a problem, if it was genuinely a problem, um, uh, we would deal with it. Um, and they have methods also of, of, of dealing with matters. That if you forgive me just for a little bit of story, um, when I was invited to join it in 2011 um, with my role at the Bank of England, I have to get permission from the governor for any external uh, appointment that I take. So I you know, had my discussions at the Bank of England. And what came of that was that they encouraged me, because they would have had similar questions, um, to do this with the proviso that if any matters came up which related to monetary policy, even though I don't sit on the Monetary Policy Committee, but I'm responsible for its proper running, um, if any of those matters came up, that I would be excused. Um, and that was put in writing um, to the Council of Economic Advisers. They accepted that as a proviso, and they have used a subcommittee system um, to ensure that uh, in those instances, I didn't have to be part of it. So there are ways to address potential conflicts, but if there really are conflicts, and I really have to think this through properly, so it's a good question to have raised, then I would address it. Okay, thanks, Gavin. Uh, um, yes, Annabelle Ewing. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, sorry, 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 oh, sorry, sorry. I, I did a I mic No, yeah, Michael, yeah. you were in the next mic okay. Sorry. That was my mistake, sorry. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, Lady Rice, in, in relation to question three, 
I'm talking about the, how do you think the Scottish Fiscal Commission should operate in reaching its position. Part of your answer, you say, this does not mean that all the judgments of the Scottish Fiscal Commission or any other body in retrospect turn out to have been the right ones, but it does mean that there must be no imputation or conflict of carelessness in making these determinations. And in a previous answer, you say that you would, it would be helpful in some instances to consult with the OBR. Um, if we had a pound for every time the OBR had been criticised in this Parliament, we'd probably cover the cost of running the Scottish Fiscal Commission. So, do you hold the OBR in high regard? Um, don't hold him in regard one, one way or the other. The mention of the OBR, uh, I believe, was in the context of uh, in getting into the detail of setting up the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and you've already done this, but, but I would want us to do it, uh, is to look around at other fiscal commissions that exist uh, and just, you know, find out a little more about the problems they've had, any issues, uh, particularly those that have been set up in the last few years that we could learn from. So uh, the relationship to the OBR that I referred to was that kind of uh, gathering some more knowledge on top of what uh, one could get from the testimony that, that your committee has published. Um, it, my point here, and it's very similar to one that, that uh, Professor Leith just made, which is that forecasting is forecasting. And you know, there's no guarantee that there is, there is no such thing as a right number out there. There. You do your best to understand the circumstances, to come up with something that seems reasonable. And we would be asked to comment on the reasonableness of the forecasts of the Scottish Government. And that is the best we can do. And that's really what I was trying to say here, is that um, the, our goal would be to, to do this as well as we could, but to point out that um, nobody, no institution, no person ever gets it all right all the time. But that was not in relationship to the OBR, how it's structured or anything. It wasn't in relation uh, to the OBR, I was just connecting the fact that you wanted to uh, indicate that you, you felt they were an organisation you wanted to consult with, and yet in this parliament they are, they are heavily criticised because um, their, their forecasts uh, are, are considered to be uh, less than valuable, and, and I think uh, Professor Leith would be interested to know whether you uh, have any uh, take on the, the, the value or the standard of the work of the OBR. Um, okay. uh, let me make one more comment then and, and, and then turn over to, to, to you. Um, when a body, so this is not a judgment about the quality of the work of the OBR, but if a body is judged to have done very well, one can learn from them. But if it's judged to have done less well, one can learn equally and sometimes more. Um, and so what you're saying, I, I understand. I was perhaps less aware of it. I am very much aware of it now um, about the discussions that you've had in the parliament here. But that would absolutely not diminish my instinct to have some conversations with them, um, you know, just because I think one learns from that. Okay. Uh, well, I think when an institution like the Bank of England does forecasting, it, it, it recognises the uncertainty, so it produces what they call fan charts. And very quickly, these fan charts get very wide, indicating that what can happen to that forecast is anywhere between a very high number and a very low number. So it's, it's, it's inherently difficult to forecast. The OBR doesn't do this formal confidence interval, doesn't do this formal fan charts analysis. They, they do a more a sensitivity analysis of, of their forecasts, which are kind of, if this scenario changed to be like this scenario, our central estimate would be this. But there's still huge uncertainty implicit in all these forecasts. So they're bound to get it wrong. That's the, it's, well, it's the nature of forecasting. So then would, be, would you believe that the Scottish Fiscal Commission would be, uh, would be doing forecasting more like the Bank of England or the OBR? I don't think we would be doing forecasting ourselves, as I understand it, in, in direct response to the question. We would be making some judgments about those who are preparing the forecasts, uh, and we would be challenging. I would hope that we would think a little bit about scenarios. I think that's a, a useful way to understand the efficacy of, uh, of, of a particular determination. Um, but I don't think we would be um, doing forecasts ourselves. My own instinct, but I'm not the economist amongst the, the three candidates you're talking to, is um, I like the fan charts. Um, they, they really do uh, explain what the potential universe is, and I think they're more helpful to people 
Um, I, I often say, and it's actually my husband's phrase, that numbers are one interpretation of reality, but there are other realities out there. Uh, and people can get very hooked on the number being the right answer. Uh, and I think what I'm trying to say, and I think what you're trying to say, is there are often a number of different answers. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Annabelle Ewing. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I, as a substitute on the committee this morning, I felt it only polite to wait for my colleagues to have their say, given their much more detailed involvement in the background to the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission. Uh, but just really picking up on something that was raised already in a question directed to, to Lady uh, Rice, I note from uh, uh, her response to question one uh, uh, that um, a number of uh, public bodies that Lady Rice has been involved in sitting on, dealing with policy matters, uh, 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 are listed, and that the point is made that um, these were uh, bodies that reported, if you like, to different administrations of different political hues. Uh, and in terms of very extensive uh, CV that Lady Rice has provided to the committee, uh, I wonder, uh, would it not perhaps be a reasonable view of this CV to, to, to take the view that uh, clearly there has been established, I would argue, a long and robust track record of independence from the political process in terms of uh, uh, Lady Rice's involvement. Uh, and I just wonder if Lady Rice would wish to add anything uh, to, 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 that, uh, to that point. Thank you for saying that, because really my point here was to say that I, I do the things I do that I'm asked to do, which are in my extra time, if you will, um, because I'm interested in them, and interested in the issues, and interested in the impact on society and, and, and so forth, um, and not interested, um, or, and, and I would not do something as a favor to an individual uh, ever, um, and not interested because someone of a particular party came and approached me. I just don't, um, I don't approach the world that way. So I would say very much, yes, these are things that have interested me, and I've had good relationships, I think, with each of the administrations since, um, uh, since Holyrood uh, began. Okay, you... okay. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, just a couple uh, final things, I think, from uh, myself. Um, Professor Leith, you mentioned in answer to a previous question, you talked about the commentaries uh, being published, and uh, there's this point that um, you also made the point in answer to question three, in my view, the Scottish Government forecasters should develop their modelling techniques and present the Fiscal Commission with both their provisional forecast and as much detail of the underlying process. So presumably there's going to be a provisional forecast, some response or commentary from the Commission, a, then a more solid final forecast, and then further commentary from the Commission. I mean, I don't know how much you've thought this through, but I mean, how much of that would you hope or expect to be published? all of it, or would only some of it be published, do you think? Uh, well, I would need to discuss this with <laughs> all relevant parties. Uh, I think, the, okay, I think the, the focus of the remit is on the, the forecast that's produced for the, for the draft budget. So the kind of final forecast that's produced there is the thing that the formal commentary has to be attached to. However, in the kind of answer to other questions, I thought it was a be a good role for the Commission to have to kind of have an ongoing look at the process, the modelling work that's being done within the Scottish Government to produce this forecast. And that will inform the detail of the commentary that's provided with the specific numbers that are attached to the forecast. So I don't think there's any need for continuous time commentaries going on throughout the year, but the commentary that's attached to the forecast at the time of the draft budget will include analysis that comes from this ongoing scrutiny of the whole forecasting process, not just the forecast itself. That, that's the way I would suggest doing it, but again, it's, it's, it's merely a suggestion open to discussion. Do you want to comment? No, I, I mean, I, I think that's a reasonable way forward, but we, we three, if it is us three, um, would have that discussion and with others and uh, actually take other suggestions as well and give it some thought. Um, what we want to be, I think, is useful at the end of the day. What we would absolutely have to have is a comment uh, in a written form when the budget is submitted, the draft budget is submitted in the autumn, which gives our best judgment on, its reasonable, on the reasonableness of the assumptions around the new taxes. So that would be an absolute given, and anything else we would discuss. I think this is quite a reasonable starting point. 
We've obviously heard from uh, two of you today, and uh, there's a third candidate we're going to be meeting uh, next week. It, so, if I understand it correctly, we're talking about two economists and one banker and businesswoman. Is that if that's how you yeah. describe yourself? Um, is that a good mix? Uh, leaving aside the individuals, but do you think as, 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 as a mix for the Commission, is that a good mix? Uh, yes, I mean, the, well, the, the forecasting process is, is, is in essence a macro-modelling process, and you know, that's, that's where I have experience. Uh, I think Lady Rice has, has a broader experience, which, which can then ask the right questions, facilitate the communication of the Commission's work uh, more generally. Uh, and Professor Hughes Hallett's uh, more involved in, in kind of practical policy analysis, so that's uh, it's a slightly different uh, bent to the more kind of techie approach that my research is involved in. So it's, it, it, it seems a, a reasonable mix as, as far as I can see. Yeah, I think, I think that as well. I mean, you have two economists who, who do quite different things in, in terms of their economics disciplines. Uh, I think both of those are really important, so it's good to have that balance. And, um, and I would simply draw on all of my experience, and I think it would, it would come to bear, because I don't think you want a purely, forgive me, academic exercise. You want something that relates back to, um, to society at large, you know, to the public that you all represent. Okay, well, we seem to have uh, gone through all the questions that the committee had. I don't know if either of you has any final comment or statement you want to make. But the questions were good, uh, good questions, and look forward to hearing your, the outcome of your deliberations. Okay, well, if I can thank you both very much for taking part. I think it's maybe been a new experience for yourselves. I think it's been a new experience for the committee as well. Uh, so hopefully that's been okay. Now, as I explained at the start of this item, the committee will hear from the third nominee at its meeting next week, after which we will consider whether or not to recommend approval uh, to the Parliament and agree a short committee report. At the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next two items in private, and I therefore now close the public part of the meeting. Thank you.